a great, great morning. Your first day in heaven when you realize your worried days aren't through. You'll be glad you were not idle. Took time to read the Bible. It's a great, great morning for you. B I B L E. Yes, that's the book for me. I sit alone on the Word of God. The B I B L E. The B I B L E. Basic instructions before leaving Earth. Basic instructions before leaving Earth. Basic instructions before leaving. And now here's our presenter, Gabriel Savant. Hello, everybody. It's great to be with you again. This is Gabriel Savant. Thank you for investing some of your valuable time to hear this special episode. It's going to put the spotlight on a most unusual doctrine. I think it's even safe to say a strange doctrine known as baptisms for the dead. Ever heard about that? Well, it's practiced by only one church. From all I've been able to surmise in my extensive research on the topic, it's the Mormon. The Mormons do baptisms for the dead. Now, their official registered name is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, LDS for short. And that's what I'll use for time's sake here along the way, along with interchanging it with Mormons from time to time. But before I drill down to explain from the Word of God the reality about said doctrine, that's very odd to millions of believers, please allow me to first take care of a bit of housekeeping, if you will. This is your flagship channel for present Truth Bible teaching. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, to Christians who already grasp what the term present truth denotes, kind of like code language to those of you who do understand it, anytime you hear me inject it into my messages, but for other Christians who are not conversant with the meaning of it, You have my bond, you've got my word with God's grace, that in subsequent episodes, not long from now, right here at the B-I-B-L-E, Basic Instructions Before Leaving Earth, I will make it crystal clear, and you will be fully familiar with the significance of present truth Bible teaching. Actually, it's essential to have these insights in order to better understand end times Bible prophecy that is being fulfilled right now at turbocharged speed, as you know, on a daily basis from everything we see in the news. It's happening at lightning speed. Now that I've covered that, gotten that out of the way, I want to say that even though I am not a Mormon, I want to make it perfectly clear right here at the outset that I have no intention whatsoever in doing some sort of a hit piece or a hit job, uh, a smear campaign on the LDS church and my refutation of their proxy baptisms for the dead. I have no interest in doing that. Frankly, I adamantly oppose the mean-spirited, even hateful and spiteful attacks by lots of Holy Joes and Sky Pilots out there today, along with the constant lack of Decency 101 that we see and hear from politicians and all over the major media news outlets and networks these days. I'm appalled by it. It's repulsive. There's really no excuse for it. They seem to thrive on trying to score cheap political points with their disparaging and even antagonistic attacks on each other. Even cursing. Heard just the other day on television, one of the major news networks from the U.S., one of the, uh, one of the commentators or guests began cursing at their opponents with the nastiest names imaginable. And they do this over so many of the cable TV news channels these days. Somebody needs to issue them a bar of soap before they go on set. Civility has become an endangered species. A bar of soap to wash out their mouths is what I mean. Civility has become an endangered species. I believe that professing Christians should be the first to take the lead in practicing civility and doing our best to express courtesy even to those who don't necessarily show it back. They don't reciprocate the same way, but we should do our best to still be civil and courteous. By the way, it's called the golden rule of Christ, often forgotten and seldom heard from many pulpits today either, and that's disturbing. Striving to treat others like we would want to be treated is the golden rule. What about Ephesians 4.32, which commands us to be ye kind to one another? Whatever happened to that? And you know, most of these ones who are on these networks these days, TV networks, they all claim to 
not all, not by any means all of them, but I would say a large percentage of them claim to be Christian. And a lot of them you'll see wearing maybe even a, a pendant, a cross pendant, you know, saying, hey, I'm a Christian, look at me. You know, I've got this religious jewelry I'm wearing. In the meantime, they're, they're nasty and mean-spirited and foul-mouthed and always trying to drag somebody through the mud. I, I don't see anything Christian about it myself, but hey. Having said that, as a gospel minister, I have the moral duty to preach the truth without fear or favor as the Bible commands. I've got to chop the wood and let the chips fall where they may. But reiterating, I don't believe for a second that in the process of that, we should try to be ugly, insulting, or uh, demeaning to others when we're conducting Bible studies or exploring passages of Scripture. When it comes to Mormons, you'll find them in all typical walks of life, including in sports. For example, Steve Young. I watched him many years ago. What a great quarterback he was for the San Francisco 49ers football team and later inducted into the NFL Hall of Fame. Steve Young is a Mormon. And by the way, he happens to be the great, great, great grandson, great three times, great, great, great grandson of Brigham Young pioneer leader of the Mormon Church, who was also the second president of the LDS Church, who replaced Mormon founder Joseph Smith after Joseph Smith was murdered. Then in 1847, Brigham Young led his Mormon faithful from Nauvoo City, Illinois, to the Salt Lake Valley, following which he founded Salt Lake City and served as the first governor of the Utah Territory. Salt Lake City in the state of Utah is where the LDS Church is headquartered. Oh, and there's Danny Ames. Danny Ames. Wow. What an outstanding guard he was for the Boston Celtics. He was an integral part of two NBA titles. when He was a teammate of superstar player Larry Bird back when they played together. They won a couple of championships in 1984, and I believe it was 1986. Over the years, I've had several dealings with Mormons, both personally and professionally. When I was residing in the southern portion of the U.S., I once had a good-natured next-door neighbor who was LDS. Parenthetically, around that same time, and i got to tell you about this, this happened some 40 years ago, 40 years in the Bible as a generation. So a full generation ago, uh, man, time slips away, doesn't it? Inflation is not transitory, despite what the government was trying to tell us several months ago, it's not transitory, but this life is transitory, isn't it? The Bible makes it clear that it is. But back in 1980, it was 1980, I remember vividly one day a couple of young fellows serving as Mormon missionaries were out riding their bicycles, as they're famous for doing, going around looking for people who might give them a chance to witness for what they feel they're called to do, according to their conviction. Well, I happened to have some spare time that day, and since I happen to be from the school that says truth can afford to be fair, I had no qualms about engaging in conversation with them. It's the opposite, really, what I was taught as I was growing up in, in the church that I came up under. They told us to don't, don't deal with those people, don't talk to them, you know, so on and so forth, kind of stay isolated. But as I began to grow up, I developed some of my own attitudes, and I felt differently about that. I I felt, you know, why not talk to them? If I've got the truth, what am I afraid of? And it sometimes works out where the ones who are out doing the witnessing, they end up being the ones who are struck with enlightening, if you know what I mean. Well, I found those two boys to be friendly enough. Actually, I wasn't much older than they were at that time, back when dinosaurs still roamed the earth. They, they were not plastic. They were cordial, but not overly jolly. I'm sure that was part of their training, no doubt so they'd be taken more seriously, increasing their chances of striking up a dialogue with total strangers, similar to what salespeople are used to doing. If you've been in sales, you know what cold calls are all about, you know, where you walk into a business without a prior appointment, we call them cold calls. Well, that's uh, sort of what the Mormon missionaries and anybody else who's out witnessing for the Lord, going from door to door or, or have you, they end up doing cold calls. Well, they were wearing their standard attire for LDS missionaries, I remember. Had on the dress trousers, along with a white shirt, standard white shirt and tie, 
and their requisite and unmistakable nameplate ID badges saying Elder Benson or I'm Elder Kimball or whomever it might be. Well, I've got to tell you a memorable anecdote from that chat I had with those two boys that day, still etched in my brain all these decades later, four decades later. Now, maybe he said it for shock value, like some of the shock jocks do on the radio. I'm not sure if he said it for shock value, but I guarantee you it got my attention that one of those adolescent LDS missionaries told me, and I'll quote, he said, due to the many unconventional doctrines taught by the LDS church, it means that we're either the one and only true church of Jesus Christ on the earth, or it means that LDS is the craziest cult to ever hit this planet, end quote. It was jaw-dropping to hear him say that. Unbelievable. It was kind of like someone had just hurled a cinder block or a hollow block smashing through a plate glass window. Now, case in point for their unconventional doctrines that the LDS missionary himself referenced would be this one. Besides their baptism for the dead teaching that we'll be taking a look at here in just a gif. But according to Joseph Smith, the founder of Mormonism, He taught that the Garden of Eden was located in North America in the vicinity of where you'll find Independence, Missouri today. My mother was born in Missouri. I've been to Missouri many times, have a lot of kin folks up there. But that's what Joseph Smith taught, that Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden and it's located where today you'll find Independence, Missouri. And then he said, Joseph said that after God drove Adam and Eve out of the garden, after they sinned, He said that Adam and Eve then ended up living about 75 miles away from Independence in a place that's known today as Davius County, Missouri, according to Joseph Smith. Bottom line is that's what Mormons actually teach. As the old cliche goes, that's straight from the horse's mouth. Now then, I categorically reject the mere notion of LDS being the true church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me make that totally clear. But furthermore, I submit that, sadly, the vast majority of the churches in Christendom have allowed certain doctrines with cultic roots to have infiltrated their places of worship, some because they never protested error to begin with, as they should have, or, over time, they re-embrace doctrines that are steeped in paganism, or ones that stem from traditions of men. Maybe they had gotten rid of those, but then they came and re-embraced them. They went back home to mama, you might say, rather than following the faith once delivered to the primitive church, to the original saints at the time of the early disciples and the apostles in the first century. Actually, I get the sense, I personally get the sense, that Mormons probably face a rather challenging situation. What do I mean by that? Well, in balancing on one hand their claim of belonging to God's one and only true church, and then you juxtapose that with the fact that Mormons are routinely referred to as a cult by the cult watchdog groups out there. The ringleader of that sect was probably the late Walter Martin, who was an American Baptist preacher who died at the young age of only 61. Back in 1965, Martin published a book entitled The Kingdom of the Cults. These self-proclaimed cult experts generally include three churches they label as their super cult, as it were, might call it their trinity of cults, LDS, SDA, Seventh-day Adventist, and last but not least, you probably know who I'm going to say next, J.W., Jehovah's Witness. Newsflash to the cult watchdogs, this is closed circuit especially for you. I want to remind you that no one owns a patent or owns a trademark on the word cult. It's something worth keeping in mind. But to believe that you're a member of God's one and only true church, it could too easily cause one to feel puffed up about themselves. And uh, to keep that in check, to keep in check a possible inflated view of oneself, you can probably start to feel like you're constantly playing that whack-a-mole game, you know, where you take the mallet, You whack the mole, it pops up, and you whack it down, and all of a sudden, oh, there's one over there. Oops, it's over here. And then you just, over and over, you're whacking these moles popping up. You're trying to knock them down, and it's round and round it goes nonstop. Meantime, when Christendom at large brands you a cult, 
Those two opposing concepts has to feel extremely paradoxical. It's got to. About as paradoxical, I guess, as that jail I heard about down in Louisiana that uses for its prisoner transport van a Ford Escape. (laughs) Oh, how ironic is that? So now I'm going to cut straight to the chase. Is baptizing for the dead biblically based, or is it just a Mormon myth? We're about to find out. Please stay tuned, my friend. Mormonism's prophet Joseph Smith said that, quote, LDS saints could act for their friends who had departed this life by being baptized in their behalf, end quote. But what does the Word of God say about it? What does the Bible have to say about it? The Holy Bible, with its divinely inspired 66 books, must always be the final authority for determining what is genuine spiritual truth for like-minded Revelation 14.12, underscore that scripture, Revelation 14.12, for like-minded, Revelation 14.12, end times Christians as myself, who are scattered over this entire globe. As a servant of the Lord said back in 1892, quote, no true doctrine will lose anything by close investigation, end quote. You know, it should raise a red flag any time that a church doctrine is erected with a single Bible verse. Sounds sketchy, doesn't it? Bible truth must be predicated on Isaiah 28.10. In the King James Version, it says, For line must be upon line, and precept must be on precept. Here a little, and there a little. End quote. Scriptures have to harmonize on any Bible subject from cover to cover. A doctrine cannot be established by taking a single verse out of context and running with it. In real estate, it's location, location, location. When it comes to proper Bible study, it's context, context, context. I testify that the Mormons attempt to build the case for their baptisms for the dead from just one verse that appears to be quite obscure and rather difficult to understand at first glance. At first glance, it does. LDS formed out of whole cloth this doctrine by misapplying 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul's well-known chapter on the resurrection, where he reflects on the resurrection of the righteous dead at the last day. In verse 29, I call your attention to verse 29, where Paul pauses to ask, quote, Else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead if the dead rise not at all? Why are they then baptized for the dead. End quote. Notice something key there? Paul does not say, why do we baptize for the dead? Instead, he asks, why do they baptize for the dead? That's the correct interpretation of it. Paul is simply saying that some people, either misguided believers or perhaps even pagans, who were baptizing for the dead, were doing it, thinking that's probably the right thing to do. But they were off track. So, despite their distorted view of true Bible baptism, at least those confused individuals who were baptizing for the dead, they they did recognize and they did realize that there must be a future resurrection of the dead. That's what Paul's talking about. Why are those who, who are doing that? They're testifying that there must be a resurrection of the dead. That's it. Bottom line. Sometimes even era contains certain elements of truth embedded within it once you Take a closer look under the hood, but then never forget that a little leaven also spoils the whole lump. But Paul was in no way endorsing, nor was he promoting, the practice of baptisms on behalf of dead people. No way. No wonder why Mormons are immersed into genealogy as they link it up with water baptism. No pun intended. (laughs) No pun intended there with uh, immersed, the way I use immersed there fact that they're immersed into genealogy and baptism. But I do hasten to add this. First Timothy 1, 4 in the King James Version says, Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies. Paul says don't do it. Goes on to say, Which minister questions rather than godly edifying, which is in faith, so do this. End quote. LDS focusing so much of their time on genealogy Tracing a person's family tree or ancestry serves as an ongoing church membership drive for them, no doubt about it. When they can persuade someone to let them baptize for their dead kinfolks, think about it, baptize for their dead kinfolks who were never baptized when they were living, 
It can obviously generate interest from their survivors, which can ultimately parlay into the LDS Church adding new living converts to their congregation. See how this works? This is not meant to be rude to LDS, absolutely not. But it doesn't take a rocket scientist to see the logic they use with their tandem teaching a baptism of the dead when coupled with the heavy emphasis they place on genealogy. They even have a full-time department within their denomination that specializes in genealogical research, and they promote it constantly and openly to the public. i got to tell you, though, I, I must tip my hat in one sense, tip my hat to them for their marketing ability from a marketing standpoint, for their being keen in, in devising that sort of system, even though I vehemently reject any over-the-top genealogical activities, and I certainly refute Baptism for the dead is having even a shred of legitimate biblical basis. In the spirit of complete fairness and transparency, I want to quote directly from the LDS Church, sharing with you what they say in their own words. I'm not putting any spin on this now. This is going to be in their own words about this, uh, this puzzling practice. I lifted this, by the way, from their website, www.lds.org. All one word, lowercase, the event you want to check it out for yourself. Article entitled, Baptisms for the Dead. I quote from it, quote, Many people have died without being baptized. Others were baptized without proper authority. Because God is merciful, he has prepared a way for all people to receive the blessings of baptism. Mormons believe that when someone dies, the spirit leaves the body and continues to live in a place called the spirit world where they continue to learn and are able to make choices while they are taught about Jesus. Performing proxy baptisms for dead ancestors is a chance for Mormons to do for those who are dead what they cannot do for themselves, end quote. Now, I've got to push back on that. No place in the Bible does it teach that dead people go to reside in some, quote, spirit world as LDS purport, nor does the Bible suggest that the dead can continue to learn about Jesus. That is completely unhinged in terms of having any biblical foundation in any shape, form, or fashion. Jesus never taught any baptisms for the dead, never even whispered it. The disciples never remotely suggested it or hinted at it either, and as I previously elucidated, it certainly was not part of Paul's statement of faith. Jesus spoke straight from the shoulder, and he lets us know that no dead person can benefit from some second-hand baptism after they have died to alter their eternal destiny in terms of either the state of or the fate of the dead. In John 5, 28 and 29, Jesus does not mince words here, friends. He says, and I quote, Marvel not at this. In other words, don't be surprised by this. Don't be shocked at this. For the hour is coming in which all that are in their graves not in some spirit world, all that are in their graves shall hear his voice, and shall come forth they that have done good, past tense, unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil, past tense, unto the resurrection of damnation or destruction. End quote. Along the lines as to what happens at death, Moses, David, Daniel, Solomon, Job, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Jesus, Luke, Paul, and John the Revelator all metaphorically or symbolically refer to death as being as a dreamless sleep. When Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, he sure didn't call him out of heaven, now did he? Lazarus came forth from the tomb, still had his grave clothes on to prove he hadn't been in heaven. You ever been dead tired falling asleep at, say, 10 p.m. at night and at 6 a.m. when the, when the alarm clock scares the daylights out of you? You woke up and it seemed as if you'd been asleep for just a second. Just a blink of the eye, snap of the finger. Dead people can't learn of Jesus. The Bible says that the dead cannot perceive nor convey anything. Ecclesiastes 9.5 in the King James Version says, and I quote, For the living know that they shall die, but the dead know nothing. End quote. Period. Full stop. Ecclesiastes 9.5 nukes the idea of any baptism for the dead. The believers who are dead for even thousands of years 
Their next conscious thought will be when they're awakened from their sleep in the dust. Paul did say to be absent from the body will result in being present with the Lord, but Paul did not say that it happens instantly. Hello, circling back to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, read what Paul has to say about the resurrection from the dead in these dynamite verses. I mean, they're dynamite. Verses 51 through 54. Now, if you don't understand this correctly or accurately, you're going to have a warped view about the stark difference between mortality and immortality. In 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 54, Paul says, and I quote, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be chained. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be chained. Nothing there about being in any spirit world. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. Immortality means not subject to death. So when this incorruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. End quote. Amen for those verses. Hallelujah. By the way, seen on the door at a church nursery is a abbreviated version of that same set of passages I just read. The sign on the door of the church nursery says, We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. <laughs> Friend, I trust that you will email us about our dedicated ministry tailored to families who live in Bakidnoon province of the Philippines who are facing food insecurity on a regular basis right now. There's, of course, no shortage of need in the world. I know that. You know that as well. There's no shortage in the world of uh, needs at this time in Ukraine and elsewhere, but we are doing what God is allowing us to do right here to reach out to the needy in Bukidnoon, Philippines. If you might can make a love gift to our efforts, it will so much be appreciated. I guarantee you that. We have a very user-friendly way of getting it done, of uh, making it happen, and the means to expedite any donations to uh, quickly materialize into bags of rice and cans of sardines or cans of tuna through the mouths of these hungry folks. Please email me at your first opportunity. Love to hear from you and receive your feedback. Not to be confused with helping to feed Filipinos, you understand. Little play on words there. Forgive me. My puns are showing again. Contact me at the Bible Stands Tall at Yahoo.com. All one word, lowercase. Thanks for listening. And until next time, this is Gabriel Savant reminding you that a Bible in the hand beats two in the bookcase. The B-I-B-L-E, Basic Instructions Before Leaving Earth. Basic Instructions Before Leaving Earth. Basic Instructions Before Leaving Earth.